Hartelijk welkom. Very warm welcome because this evening is going to be in English. Very warm welcome. My name is Yuri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali and I will try to lead this evening, this talk, this conversation we're going to have tonight. And um, a warm welcome to you all. Warm welcome to the viewers at home because there are probably uh, a lot of people wa watching this conversation on the internet. Um, this is an evening we put together to, uh, together with the Holland Festival. I'm really happy to work with them. Um, I don't think I need to explain the Holland Festival. It's going to be from the 29th to, of May to the 23rd of June this year again. Um, and um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, the functions of art in conflicted countries, the function of art and the function of art institutes in conflicted countries. Um, uh, we have three speakers here who um, uh, we've invited to talk about. And um, what can art do? And if you think that uh, art in a country like Holland is important, um, um, is it different in conflicted countries? And what, what, can, it, what can it do? What, what if, you, if you use the Dutch word, uh, what vermag kunst in a land where um, a conflict heerst? Vermag vind ik altijd een mooi, mooi woord. I'm trying to explain it in Dutch to the Dutch. <laughs> um, uh, um, and it's um, it's a great pleasure to um, to be here and talk with about this because um, we're trying to have here an art center in which we sometimes think it's difficult to to work, but then I then we start realizing that um, if you're in contact with other places in the world that you know you might think that it's difficult to make art in Holland, but it's of course not. <laughs> it's if you if you compare that to um, other places in the world. Um, it, you're up against uh, much more um, um, uh, bigger problems than we have, of course, and that, that's, um, I think, also good to realize. In that light, you suddenly see um, art as a different, as a different uh, uh, beast or a different species of, uh, of being. And we are going to talk with uh, Faustin Lignecula. Um, he is the uh, curator at this moment, uh, one of the two curators of the uh, Holland Festival, Congolese dancer, choreographer, storyteller, and also the founder and director of Studios Kabako in Congo, um, which is an art center uh, in Kisangani at the moment. And um, he's here also because he's curating uh, the Holland Festival together with um, uh, William Kentridge, who we're going to talk later on this year, um, also leading up to the Holland Festival. We've invited uh, uh, Biri Shalmazi, a Dutch filmmaker with uh, roots in Iran, Kurdish Iran roots, uh, who's been working in Erbil in the, over the past year as a filmmaker, and who've been living in Erbil for quite a while. And we're going to talk with Desi Gavrilova, theater maker and a founding founding mother and director of the Red House, uh, which is in many ways an art center, some, in some ways um, an art center as the Bali is, and um, uh, in Bulgaria and Sofia. So thank you very much, all three, for coming here. Um, we, all three, we asked you to bring a, um, uh, an example of art in a conflict country, and we're going to talk uh, about these examples. Can I ask the three of you to um, join me on the, on the stage? Um, and uh, take one of the seats. I'm going to take the seat uh, over there. <laughs> and, um... We've asked all three of you to uh, bring examples of what, uh, an example in which we can sort of discuss the, the questions at hand, the questions we're going to talk about this evening. Um, but maybe, maybe uh, 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 first of all, um, I want to kick off with a few questions for, for each of you. Um, Faustin, um, you decided to, um, to start an art center um, and actually uh, go back to uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, as we should call it now, and to start out in a very conflict place to uh, build up a place to do your art. Um, is there... Could you s tell us a little bit about the main reason, or one of the main reasons, or one of the main, um, uh, why you did that, how you decided, how you came to do that? Hmm. Well, I never set out to build an art center, mm -hmm. really. All I wanted was to be able to make my work, to tell my stories, um, 
because I'm known as a dancer, choreographer, but yeah. I really like introducing myself as a storyteller. And in the year 2000, I understood, uh, I'd been outside my country for eight years then, um, first in Kenya, and then I started working in Europe and elsewhere in Africa. And like after those eight years, I understood that what I really wanted was to tell stories from back home. Um, or should I say, maybe I don't have so much imagination, so I just pick stories that are around or inside me and try and build something out of that. And, and so, and the experience of being outside my country never really um, inspired me to do work, even though the question of exile is very important at an intellectual, emotional level, but when it came to making work, it never um, was like a necessity for me. So I said, if I want to do something that's true to what I believe in, I need to go back to my country. But then when I get there in 2001, the country is at war, and I couldn't even go to the city of Kisangani, which is my city. So I went to the capital, Kinshasa. It's like, no one is doing the kind of work I'm doing. So where do you begin from? So maybe you just need to create the platform for you to be able to do your work. So it really grew out of necessity. Maybe I had a choice between making solos for the rest of my life mm -hmm. or working with people. And so it's like, well, I do what I do, not to be alone, basically. Uh, and for like the first 10 years of Studio Kabako, I never made a solo work because I was just not, that's not the space I wanted to be in. I wanted to be with people. And if there is no one there, if there's no dance school, well, you become the dance school. If there is no theater, you figure out how to shift the relationship of the, uh, the notion of theater from a building to that of a relationship. So a, a yard becomes a theater. So it's, and then as you're doing that, so you wake up one morning, you realize, oh, I've become an institution. <laughs> and was there a moment where you realized that? Can you remember that moment? Or um, that well, you see, it's all about um, the people around you. And mm -hmm. when you realize that there are families around here who really need you to be here and who need you to be doing what you're doing so that they can be able to pay their rent to feed their children and to take care of um, themselves when they're ill. And you know that if you stop doing what you're doing, literally people can die. Because people die in that country because they don't have $20 to get treated for malaria. So yeah. suddenly it's like, oh, okay. And then you have all these younger ones who like, they come to you, and it's like, yeah, we have this idea. Could you help us? And if you give someone 500 US dollars, because in Congo we count in dollars, if you give someone 500 dollars, it's a lot of money for them to make work. So, so it's, okay, I've become this institution now. And, but I never set out to be that. I wish I didn't have to do that. But hey, that's my context. It was, in a way, very practical because you needed a place to do your art. Exactly. Yeah. And if no one can do it for me, well, I just have to... Have to organize it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because there's no infrastructure, so you need to, to do it. And yeah. out of that necessity, it starts vibrating with others, and so at some point, then you, you, you start realizing what's going on, and like, okay, now I need to formalize this. So we'll create an administrative structure that, that needs to be registered um, with the various ministries. And, and this way, also, if I'm talking you know, with Holland Festival, uh, they can send money somewhere. Because, yeah, they, they better deal with another institution. Yeah. You know. yeah. Doesn't that distract you from doing your art? Because you're doing a lot of performances and, and, and big. No. no. Actually, I consider that to be my creative work as well. Mm -hmm. um, really, uh, I, 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 I'm convinced that I don't need to produce artistic objects to call myself an art, artist. It's all about creating spaces 
and spaces of possibility and above all spaces of imagination. Yeah. You know, so that's wonderfully said. I, I understand what you mean. It's not it doesn't need to be a touchable object. No. It's as important to have uh, the the place or the space or the yeah. Yeah. Understand. Um, Desi, can I ask you a, a sort of the same question? Because you did something like that, the, uh, starting the Red House, uh, over 15 years ago, I think, yeah, 17 I can, years ago. Mm, yeah, I can very much relate to what I just heard. Uh, you know, my coming of age in the beginning of my professional uh, life, so to say, coincided with the period in Bulgaria where the country started on the road of getting uh, democratized, uh, developing new institutions, opening culturally and in any other sense. So this was really a time, as you said, when there was nothing. Like the landscape was starting from there were no businesses because we were a state-owned economy and this had to be established. Uh, coming to, there were no cultural institutions, there were no spaces to create free art, there was no independent media, there was nothing. So basically, as someone said, you could just name yourself something and you become something. <laughs> in a way, uh, in this context, it's easy and it's difficult, I think, to start something new and to start an institution because there's no competition, basically. You're there, and this was our story. We said, we are the Bulgarian the Bali, so to say. Actually, the Bali was our inspiration uh, when we were starting the Red House. Um, and we were thinking of the Red House as a place for free artistic creation. We wanted to give space to the many independent groups that were emerging in this period, that were starting to emerge. Uh, but also we wanted to provide the broader context in which this uh, work is going to be seen. And also we are very much unsatisfied with the partisanship of our media, the way they uh, defend party interests or economic interests. We wanted also to create a space uh, not only for art but for free debate and for free exchange of views. And um, this is how we came up with the format, which already existed already then, by that time here. Um, and um, yeah, we found the Red House. This was back um, 18 years ago now. But the, and you're a theater maker yourself. You make uh, documentary theater and um, um, you do that in different places in Europe, but also in the Red House. And Sophia, yep. would, you, would you agree with Fostan that, that it doesn't distract you doing all the business of running an institution and that it's actually something which um, is the art in itself or how do you look upon that? Because in a way, it is a lot I'm of work an incidental theatre maker so to say <laughs> uh, but it's true that we created a space for the emergence of the genre of uh, documentary theatre in Bulgaria so to say by hosting the two groups that started this genre, one with the German director who came to work in Bulgaria, another Bulgarian group. So, uh, and actually documentary theater and the documentary approach in art in general is very uh, interesting and important for me because, um, as I said, this period that I described when we were starting to become a democratic country, uh, or at least we're trying to be that, it was seen from the outside as, yeah, the end of history. We know now everything's just going to be good. We are becoming members of the European Union and all this. At the same time, living in these countries, living in Bulgaria, living in many other Central and Eastern European uh, countries, you notice other things that are happening. Um, one figure just to, and you can imagine what is behind it. Um, Bulgaria was recently pronounced by UN the fastest shrinking country demographically in the world. So in the last 30 years, we lost 2 million people. And in the next 30 years, we will lose another 2 million. Um, these are people's stories. These are families. This is producing a huge loss and an empty space within the country, which cannot be filled. It's emotional empty <coughs> space. It's in any sense. Mm -hmm. It's distorting families. It, you have lots of families where children are being raised by their grandparents because the parents work uh, in Spain or yeah. whatever. 
there are all these stories that if you don't talk about them, and I find that the documentary theater, documentary art is the great way to talk about, to bring this part of reality into the picture and to create an emotional affiliation with these stories, then you don't understand actually what's going on in these countries. So this is how art and discourse, analytical and emotional, came together in an institution. Mm -hmm. And you need an institution which tells these stories, also the the, is that, is that uh, can you um, understand that? Is that uh, some, in some way the same you're doing in Kinshasa, that it's important to tell the stories of the people who are there in their own surroundings or in their own city? Yeah, I can or, relate very much to the um, country mm -hmm. attempting to get into a democratic space. Mm -hmm even though we've been trying that since 1990, because until then it was one, a single political party system. It was the, the, the political party was the state and vice versa. And in our case, um, it's lasted 32 years with one man in power, Mobutu Sese Seko, and who stayed in power for all those years thanks to the West or, or thanks to the Cold War. So. They needed a shield against communism in the heart of Africa, so mm -hmm. they protected this man, and in 1990, he was no longer uh, needed. So like, okay, now you can be a nice guy, give democracy to your people. And, but we needed to learn to, to speak in the first place, because you've never been allowed to even say your name. And literally, uh, I mean that because I was not officially <coughs> first time during uh, those years. I would go to prison if I had first time on my official document because Mobutu had decided from 1971 that we had to ban um, European names. Uh, and that's when he changed his own name from Joseph Desiree Mobutu to Mobutu Sesiseko Kuku Bendwaza Banga. He invented a new name for himself. <laughs> and everyone had to do that, or you'd go to prison, or you, you couldn't. And so, how do you even begin to speak when, for all those years and for generations, um, you never knew how to do so? And so, maybe. These spaces are like a way of learning how to talk already amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if we feel strong enough, we can now come forward and share that with others. But it's really also like creating a little space where, like, okay, I feel safe here. I can try and say something. Yeah. Starting with your name. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. As, as basic as that. Yeah. Can I say something? Because Please. Yeah. Again, I very much relate no, to this because yeah. when we started uh, Red House and with these public debates to organize in Bulgaria, this was as late as 2000 and 2000, 2001, we were the first uh, initiative organization to op do open debates like here. Before that, you can go by invitation, there were some conferences closed, etc. So people didn't uh, ha know this genre, so to say. And at the beginning, they were coming and they were not speaking, people from the audience. We opened for the audience and there were not questions. So within, with the years, I noticed how really we started and developed little by little this culture of open dialogue and of voicing your opinion freely. And it takes time, but now there are many organizations doing this and that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, you have to, 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 to learn that or yeah. to, to explore it. Yeah. Uh, Beri, uh, can I ask you, um, um, you are a filmmaker mainly, and uh, you write, you're a journalist as well, but um, um, you've been going back to uh, Kurdistan, uh, the Iraqi part of it, not the uh, Iranian part, uh, which your family originally comes mm -hmm. from, but um, also to make movies there, and, to, um, um, and I read somewhere that you said it's important to make them there, about the stories who are there. Um, um, is that, in a way, the same as establishing, uh, telling stories who are ma made there in that language, uh, the same function for you, or is it totally different? Is oh, it? Definitely, it, it has multiple functions, of course. Of course, yeah. But everything I hear around me, I can relate to when it comes to 
Kurdistan. And I think what makes it complicated when you talk about Kurdistan is it's not just one place, it's four or maybe according to some five places at the same time. And mm -hmm. I was born and raised in Europe, uh, became a filmmaker, and the only way I could relate to where my parents came from was through the few images that would come out at film festivals, for example. Mm -hmm. And let's say I would see one film every other year, and that's how I would create an image of where my, sto my own story comes from. So when things were changing rapidly in Iraqi Kurdistan, <coughs> And for family reasons, it's impossible for me to go to Iran. When Iraqi Kurdistan became stable enough, not just me, but a lot of young filmmakers from diaspora started turning towards uh, the home country. Mm -hmm. um, I figured I couldn't just fly in, make a film and come back. I felt like I had to be there to create honest stories because I, if I would fly in, film and come back, I would tell what was already in my mind and that would not be fair to the people whose stories I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, why I made the decision to live there and to teach at the local film school in Erbil, at the oldest university I think in the entire Iraq even with a horrible film department. I was so disappointed because I went to film school here in Amsterdam, the yeah. Film Academy, which is at least technically one of the best you can find. And I found myself very lucky to be able to study there. And then I probably went to the worst to teach. Um, so that, that was a very tough uh, moment for me because I felt like, yes, now I have this power and I can teach them what I've learned and even though the students were quite young they still suffered from what I would call a Saddam Hussein syndrome mm -hmm. although maybe they never really witnessed his appearance in their life and what would um, the syndrome the, look like? Or yeah, the system, the schooling system is still the same mm -hmm. this means, and this is I guess in a couple of ways terrible for art in the first place because um, because art is considered very low. Uh, you go study film when you're too uh, dumb to study engineering or medicine. So people <laughs> with the lowest grades, and I was in the commission myself, people with the lowest grades, let's say 100 is the highest when you graduate from high school. Those are the people who, who get have the chance to enroll into engineering, um, medicine or maybe law, if you're not smart enough for the other two. So the people who would enroll into art, so theater, film, other forms of art, were those who had maybe like 55, 60 points, they barely graduated. So in the interviews, and this, this is a <coughs> trauma to me, I remember in one of like the students would show up and we had to pick I don't know, maybe 30 students. And I remember my own uh, interview at the film school here in Amsterdam. I was so nervous because it's so special to get in. And here, these kids, they come in. Have you seen a film? Well, I've watched some series. What would you call the difference between art house cinema and Hollywood? I never seen a movie called Hollywood. So. Or the only film they would, they would be able to name quite often would be Titanic. And first I would blame them. I was very hard. I was like, how can you think you can study film if you don't make an effort into mm -hmm. seeing films? And then I realized, Peri, where do you want them to see films even? How, and this is a few years back. This is like five years ago. So the internet was not as good as it is now. And... Um, the war in Syria had already started, so the illegal DVD source had also stopped. Um, so it was very hard for them to, to find films and to judge quality. Um, I think back then, 2013 it must have been, when uh, the first film theater inside a shopping mall had reopened. Uh, 
So there was no foundation to even think about film, let alone thinking of building a career in film. And that situation for me summarized that, okay, I can go back, I can even bring an entire crew from Amsterdam, I can stay long enough to do research to thinking I can come close to their stories. Mm -hmm. um, but that's so, that takes so much effort. It's so different from the environment I was lucky enough to work in, apply to the film fund, work with a Dutch TV channel and make basically whatever you want without even thinking of those circumstances. So feeling all these pains and the lack of everything, although uh, the region we're talking about was doing really well economically, so that was not the issue. We actually had the same problem where people would step up, step up and be like, I'm a, di I'm a director. And then you would figure out they did a two-day course somewhere in Europe. So they were the most developed filmmakers you could find there. So this is, this is the landscape that I went back to. Yeah, and would you say that, um, that in a way, um, building up, because it's interesting you're saying, yeah, Biri, where do you expect them to see the films and judge quality? Huh? Um, so it's also a, a lack of a, a cinema, where an art house cinema, for yeah. instance. Or um, would you say that, that in your experience, um, bringing back language of culture um, in many ways, whether it's film mm -hmm. or dance or theater, or, um, that it adds something to the democratic um, uh, uh, structure in, in a region, or is that, is that too idealistic and doesn't make any difference? Well, it, it, <laughs> I think it's true. Mm -hmm. It's idealistic, but sure. if we don't <laughs> follow ideals, then there's no point in what we're doing. And um, I believe it is what is going on, because for to break it down to a small example, mm -hmm. I was teaching screenwriting, and I asked the students to write a certain scene themselves, and they ended up all writing down the exact same. Why? Because they are drilled to just copy-paste, copy-paste, copy-paste. And that's an effect of dictatorship. So in a very direct sense, it definitely adds, because you right. ask yeah. students to think for themselves and to see the value of their own thoughts. So from that perspective already, it's true. And then, of course, uh, from the perspective of when this seed grows, it means you will get multiple perspectives and the comfort of storytellers to tell <coughs> their own stories and in the way they see their world. First, I saw you nodding at my question. Um, um, is that uh, too idealistic of me or is that the sa do you have the same experience? I mean, it's a question of scale. Yeah. Um, Does that matter, scale? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, I, somehow, if you ask me deeply, yeah. I think um, I still believe in the possibility of a revolution. Yeah. Really. But definitely not uh, in the 20th uh, century historical sense where it's like everyone stands up and we topple down the regime and we build a new system where it everyone you know, mm -hmm. is, it, no I don't believe in that okay. um, I, and I, I think it would be too painful for me to put myself in that space really because objectively speaking I don't see that happening <coughs> in the world that I'm operating in and so I'm tempted to say that no my art cannot save Congo no but, but. it can save individuals mm -hmm. Uh, I, I talked earlier on about families now yeah. who can afford to eat, to send their children to school yeah. and to get treated in yeah. a country where it's a luxury for many to even have a decent meal a day. So already it's like those people, something is changing in their lives. And so there is that small scale. And then if these people 
So if we start by saying no one cares about art, and maybe it's not the most important even in that context, the most important is to be able to believe in something in, in a context where it's hard to believe in anything. So I start from there. And the people I'm around, you know, who, are, um, who are around me, like for them to believe in this, I need to find a way to give them enough work that will feed all of us. Literally, we can put food on our table. Yeah. Once that starts to be taken care of, <coughs> now we start thinking about big things. Because I believe in these big things, you know, literally changing the world, mm -hmm. but one person at a time. And that's why this idea of the name is so important yes. as the starting point, but only as a starting point. Um, when you grow up in a, di in a dictatorship, individuals don't exist. We can't, <coughs> as you just said, we can't think for ourselves. We're just part of a herd. We have to follow the shepherd, the dictator. So learning to look at yourself is the first step. And what I like about the name is that if you're serious about the name, you can never collapse into yourself, into a me, 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 me kind of thing, no. Because every name opens a web of relationships. Relationships to place, to people, to history. And so that's where we need to start. Uh, and this way, I stand here and I say, my name is so-and-so, and how does that resonate with the people around me? What is that space between us? So maybe being a dancer, you know, I mm -hmm. can visualize these things. It's about being grounded, you know, finding my own spine, and then realizing that, oh, there's another dancer there. What's this space between us? What do we do about that space? And, and so if someone becomes aware of themselves and they need to learn that, it takes many years. So maybe you can call that a democratic space. Maybe, but I, I, I'm afraid to put mm -hmm. such a big word on it because it's, it's a huge word, democracy. Yeah. You know? And so I just would like to talk modestly of like, hey, we're doing this, and Genoa Lolo is beginning to create a space. So we're opening small spaces, and it will take the time that it will take. You're saying a lot of beautiful things. You're saying, among other things, first, of course, a few people you know, are eating because of what I do. So that's where I start. That's where I start, and that's why it's also important. Um, <coughs> But then you added to that, but you need to um, uh, teach people and let them realize to believe in something. And so I was wondering, because if I listen to the first part, what you said, you could say, well, if it's only about food, you know, maybe you better start an NGO right, to provide food because it's, because, because it's maybe easier. Uh, but then you added to that, no, no, but you have to start with believing, yeah, if pe to make people believe in something. Is that the art part? Or is that, or could you maybe better just be an NGO? Um, the, the, um, I cannot be an NGO, because NGOs are there with the pretension that they're there to help others. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for myself. I need a space where I don't feel too alone. NGOs are there, if there's no funding, they leave. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to leave, I'm there to stay. Yeah. And because I want to stay and because uh, I don't want the only, to be the only one uh, who, who's doing something uh, in a collapsing world, because then everyone <coughs> else will come for me. So I need to do, at my own little scale, I need to do something so that there are some others around me who can also make their own space or spaces. And this way, I'm not, I don't have all the pressure. So that's definitely not NGO uh, business. So maybe there is um, this thing of, <coughs> Also, why it, can, uh, it cannot be an NGO 
type of mentality, mm -hmm. it is that I've seen, for instance, in Kisangani, this is a small city of 1.3 million. We call that a big city, but yeah. <laughs> Congo is, yeah. Compared to the capital with its 12 plus million, yeah. And there is the Congo River going right across the city. And on the South Bank, you have around 200,000, 200,000, 250,000 people living there. I grew up in part there and in the 80s when I was a teenager, we didn't have running water. 35 years later, 30 years later, it's still the same. But like 10 years ago, the Red Cross or some Médecins Sans Frontières, some NGOs, they went there and they drilled a bowl, a hole, well. Yeah. a well. Yeah. But because there was no sense of ownership by the people, they come, they plant it, and they go. Mm -hmm. The day one little piece of the pump uh, broke. Not broke, it doesn't cost five euros to replace it. There was no one to do it. So definitely, you're know, like, no way. Mm -hmm. You can never build anything if this is the mentality. Yeah. So how do we learn to be responsible for our own space? So it's like, I, I, I'm not saying teaching anyone. I hate the word teaching. I'm not a teacher. But I think that we can learn together. Yeah. Something and we can learn to say, if I, you know, if I say my name is, am I aware of all the implications? Can I be really responsible for what I'm saying now? And so, learning to be responsible for oneself, learning to believe in something, knowing that it's never given once and for all. It's not because today something works that it will work tomorrow. Because, yeah, we get into self-doubt and everything is really not worth it. You just think about leaving the country and going wherever. You know. So you go through all those cycles and always trying to find a way of remembering that, hey, there is a reason to believe. <coughs> but, yeah, to keep it small. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's I understand. Mm -hmm. to keep, and, and and because if you make it bigger or too big, it, it's no longer true. It's no longer. Um, you, um, we asked you to um, uh, bring something to to, to show. Uh, we, you said you brought a, um, a short video clip about your center. Um, what will we be looking at? Virginie, help me. What are we looking at again? It, well, let's, 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 have a, let's have a look at yeah. it and we talk afterwards. Hmm? It's... Okay. We have, oh, it's... Um, uh, the, yeah, I don't know how to summarize that, so let's just... So that's, that's fine, that's fine. We, we'll have, we, we watch it and yeah. then we talk about it. Then we talk. Yeah. Yeah. L'infrastructure la plus importante, c'est l'infrastructure humaine. Et que si je veux construire quelque chose, il faut que je m'entoure des bonnes personnes. C'est les personnes qui sont capables de regarder dans une certaine direction. Les gens avec qui je peux rêver. Et après... Dans les studios qui sont venus, ils nous ont, ils nous ont montré qu'est-ce que c'est, qu'est-ce que c'est l'important de ce qu'on faisait. Et puis, tu comprends que bon, c'est un cas simple, des locaux, tous ont la légère Isaac, c'est quelque chose de bien. On, on peut aussi gagner sa vie dans ça. On vient qui Kisangani, mais il y a un modèle économique qui est créé au Congo, montré une ou deux fois et partir en tournée et revenir. Je 
je vends des spectacles dans des festivals, des théâtres à l'étranger, aux états unis ou en Europe. Une fois que j'ai payé mon équipe et je me suis payé, le reste on garde pour faire vivre le travail ici. C'est quoi la danse Et puis, message nous, elle surtout il est important, mais il y a un message Joël Bango. Et par rapport à la projet à Fafa Finaray, message où tu es là, il y a une sensibilisation par rapport à la mort et tout, et tout. Alors comment, comment tout se prend en charge, tout se poser la question par rapport à la vie, ceux qui te profilent et tout ça. Bienvenue à ce spectacle. Pour quitter milliers scénique, c'est-à-dire est théâtre, le fait seulement qu'on qu déplace. Parce que nous avons eu accès à un théâtre. Tout ça, l'échange, le dialogue, le par rapport à l'art, la façon dont nous avons évolué. Bonjour, 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 On peut construire un immeuble qui soit le lieu physique des studios Kabako. Mais si Kabako, c'est d'abord un esprit, un état d'être, une manière de se réunir au monde, si les studios Kabako sont cet espace où il y a quelque chose qui se passe au niveau de l'investissement des humains et que ça devient un espace où il y a des gens dans ce pays, dans cette ville, qui commencent à croire que et ça possible. Mais est-ce qu'il y a d'autres formes d'un autre, d'un être vivant face à d'autres êtres vivants qui respirent ensemble dans le même espace, cette communauté qui est un acte extrêmement politique de réunir les gens autour d'un sujet, autour d'un projet It's very nice to have the images with it, with the things you just you just told uh, told us. You just saw our studio, the blue floor. Yeah, yeah. and the frame. Yeah. yeah, it's important to have frames, um, <laughs> especially when everything is falling apart. So it's like a way for me of constructing a space that I understand. It's like okay. At least this, yeah. I think I understand this. You're a bit like in the Renaissance when they invented perspective in painting. Yeah. You know, to kind of make the world measurable. Yeah. You know, which also uh, coincided with the invention of cartography. So on the other hand, I'm a bit conflicted with that because that's also the invention of colonialism. You know, when you start, you know how to measure the world. That mm -hmm. When you start exploring it yeah, and conquering and then it, then you yeah. say, "Oh, I conquer it." So yeah, yeah. But somehow, so maybe I'm a colonialist deep down. And say, <laughs> I'll put frames here so that I can control the world a bit. Yeah. Controlling the world around you, or Uh, making a space might be different than the rest to do with the whole world. You just said, you know, keep it small. It's yeah. a big difference, I would think, but maybe not. True. <laughs> True. But, um, 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 and uh, Abidi just told us that um, it was, uh, um, it struck her very much that um, if you're too dumb, as you said, to go to um, uh, um, engineer school, you go to art. Um, and that's one of the results of dictatorship might be. Right? But um, is that something, um, because if you look at the joy of these, these, these images you, you brought, um, uh, it's very well received. Or is that something which goes to, is, is recognizable in Kinshasa and Kisangani as well? But, well, when you look at those images, mm -hmm. you see the poor people. 
Mm -hmm. You don't see the powerful no. there. No. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, really being an artist was like considered to be the lowest of the law really? in a society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's interesting to just analyze the lyrics in Congolese pop um, music from the 80s and even until the late 90s. There were many songs where, because we always we, we sing mainly about love and you know, falling down couples. And, and so you'd hear a lot of singers say, well, darling, you don't, your family doesn't like <coughs> me because I'm only an artist. But, you know, uh, you see, there are no stupid jobs, it's only stupid people. That was then. And then came the crisis. And with the crisis, it turned out that you could have you know, a master's or a PhD, a PhD and still starve. So the values, the system values, uh, uh, the value system changed. And at some point, because it was, everyone wanted to leave, and it was difficult for everyone to get a visa, but it was, less difficult for artists to tour, suddenly it was like, oh, those are the privileged ones. So the world so turned upside it's down. It's like, yeah. yes, it's like, ah, uh, it's not so stupid after all being an artist. So today, yeah, many you know, I went to school with are in the political mafia. You know, some have been governors or ministers and at the top level. And it's so like, yeah, I'm only an artist, but it's like, we are, we are a colonial state in that legitimacy comes from outside. So the fact that Europeans take me seriously, it's like, ah, so we can, so you see, it's not about what you're doing. It's about what it represents. Mm -hmm. So, the very same people who may look down at art in general, mm -hmm. and even today they look down at art, but they don't look down at you know, yeah, or me because it's like, oh, but yeah, here's... Able to travel and... Yeah, you know, and he travels yeah, and, and so he even has... He's going to have he even has a white woman. Woman. He even has a white woman. So mm -hmm. that's like... <laughs> Thanks, Virginie, for saving, you know, <laughs> you know, my, uh, you know, my position in that society. <laughs> you know. But I think you made a really important point saying uh, the legitimacy um, you get because you're valued abroad. That's very recognizable. Don't you also think it's because of the lack of that industry of the dance and theater industry in your home country, that it's hard to value it because there's not much, or there is some, but not much comp to compare it with. Hmm. They know what we're doing there, because I may not expect anything from the government, but I make sure that they know what we're doing. And when you talk to them, it's like, oh, we're very proud of what you're doing, and you are <coughs> an ambassador for the country and for the province, for our city. Um, so I really don't know if it is because, or rather, it's a, it's a crazy, um, situation, is it like this because they, were, um, they never built really institutions? Or there are no institutions because we are not valued enough. So, but I also know that 
there was a period of, yeah, in the history of that country where art was taken seriously. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's strange for me to sit here and say that under the dictatorship of Mobutu, yeah. there was support for the arts. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, have I just said that? Because this was Mobutu, uh, for those 32 years, it's like the biggest wastage you could ever imagine. Le plus gros gâchis pour ce pays. He had all the cards in his hand. And he did to, nothing with them. And yeah. he, no, he did a lot uh, with them. But for his family, for well, his yeah. friends, yeah. and you have millions, and uh, if not billions, in banks in Switzerland, and, and villas in France, and Morocco, and everything. So he did a lot with that. Uh, but like in 1974, <coughs> He founded what came to be known as the National Ballet of Zaire. And, okay, it's got nothing to do with the ballet no, as we know it here. It's, they just used the name. But the National Ballet was this troupe where they brought together uh, uh, many dance forms and music forms from the whole country and put them together in the hope that it could create a national identity. You know, and because it was all a question of how to build a nation when your people identify themselves with their tribe. So it's like, okay, let's bring together their dancers and this how become, it could become a lab, uh, a lab to create an, um, um, an identity. An identity. Yeah. And they did put a lot of money into this, at least for 10 years until 1984. The National Ballet was really carried by a special presidential fund. And I'm right now working with three elders from the National Ballet who've been there since 1974, who are in their um, late 60s, only 70s now. Mm -hmm. And when they talk about Mobutu, their eyes are just glittering. It's like, oh my god, we were so good. And one would say, oh yeah, with my salary, I would pay rent, buy food, take care of everything. And when the next salary came, there was still money. And that went on for 10 years. And there was a national theater, national museum. But, but, but what does that tell you? You're saying, oh my god, I'm sitting here. Am I saying that under Mobutu there yeah, was? Yeah, you know, that's... And it, I don't want to say any good things about Mobutu. I just wish I could slap the man and you know, even uh -huh. in, you know, from his grave and continue beating him down that, hey, this happened. And so if that been that example, it means that the authorities somehow at some point, they understood that art could serve their propaganda and so they, put in, they did put in money. And now they just put in money as well, but to bury one of the greatest musicians from the Congo who died a month ago and he was buried a couple of days ago, the government did spend a million US dollars to bury Simaro. Not all of it went to the funeral, but that's the official figure, a million US dollars. <laughs> Not everything went to the funeral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were Just, wanting to yeah, comment from on that. from another former communist country, I relate very much to this. And of course, art was very important in all communist countries. <coughs> and it was very, at that time, it was very prestigious. And actually, it was the most difficult uh, academy to go into was the theater academy and the film academy. It was just the opposite of what you described now. And I, I guess in the communist time, it was everywhere like this. It was very prestigious because, of course, being an artist, you also were then exposed to certain limitations and you had to serve the ideological uh, You had to serve, to serve, serve the, yeah, basically. the power that be. Yeah. Well, the power or at least not uh, come into conflict into mm -hmm. it, with it. Um, and of course, there is, we have lost that also in, in my country. 
Uh, but I relate to many of the things that, that you said, also about this legitimation from abroad that you were saying. In the early in the 90s, probably, this was very much uh, so that whatever you start something new and it's okay. It was okay for us to start the Red House because there was Chris Coleman, who is sitting in the... <laughs> Director here, of supported the yeah. by the Dutch embassy in Bulgaria to come to Bulgaria, say this is a very good thing, there is the, the Bali working there, come and look and somehow convince the Minister of Culture and everyone there that, oh, that's something which civilized, civilized countries in the West have, let's have it, okay. They didn't support it in a way like funding, etc., but they allowed us to do it, basically. Um, they gave us a building which we then invested in renovating and equipping, etc., which be became the Red House. But there is something which happened, and I think it will probably happen in, in your countries as well, uh, as the years were going, that at some point this le legitimation from abroad uh, doesn't work. And the countries as a whole, even if you look at uh, Central Europe, are turning against what the West is telling them is good or bad. Look at Hungary, for example. Look, look at Poland. I mean, at some point, there is this sort of emancipation of we know better, actually, what is good uh, uh, for us. Um, so, yeah. Ah, that was <laughs> the nice small mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I read in uh, one of the interviews I read uh, about you leading up to this conversation, of course, I read that you said somewhere, um, well, um, I'm pretty much able to do um, what I what I want with my art. I'm not um, uh, hindered by the government. I don't, they don't, because it's only if you threaten their power that they will kill you, huh? yeah. which is um, a very... <laughs> um, 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 efficient way of, <laughs> of telling your situation, I think. it's. But then you added something that was really beautiful, I think. You said, and also because I use the language of poetry. Because if I um, use poetry, I can't be, um, I'm running before, I'm running ahead. And because of running ahead, using sort of new, new forms or new, and you're not able, they're not able to catch me. Um, is that something you do? Um, because you, you just said on the, in the movie, you said, so what we do is deeply political, what you're saying as well. Is that a way of um, contributing to the discourse by staying ahead or, 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 or being too smart for the powers that be to understand what you're actually <laughs> doing or saying? Mm. Well, never underestimate. Um, the power of any dictatorship, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it can break you. And, and in this particular case, see, there is, you know, on one hand, I just dream of poetry. Is ultimately, Telling stories, making dancing, and all that. I just I so <coughs> dream of being a poet with what I'm doing. Yes, I believe that's the ultimate art form. And but at the same time I'm a citizen and I'm like I need to take position and yeah. But in that context, if my work becomes too militant. Okay, I believe that one, it, it will make, you know, put my life literally in danger. Mm -hmm. Because it's easy to be found dead in that country, literally. Yeah. It's very easy. And, but also it will put my poetry in danger. Because poetry pushes you to those spaces where you're contradicting yourself, and when I'm in a militant mode, I say this is good, this is bad. In the poetic space, <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. So maybe saying good things about Mobutu is that stupid space. Um, and so, 
may be a way of protecting my own self against the militant. It's like just trying as much as possible to go to approach poetry as a way of protecting myself against the demons of preaching uh, this is good, this is bad yeah. kind of thing. And, and also in the hope that, yeah, dictatorship yeah, can be a step behind poetry and so they'll, they cannot catch me. Uh, because if I say, okay, now, um, Chisekedi, the current president, is just a puppet of Kabila, I might get arrested, but I need to find another way of saying it and not, and if I'm attacked, I can always say, no, I'm just a dancer, I'm only dancing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, like, the history of art in the 20th century in the Soviet bloc was a very interesting one. And of, when you look at films by someone like Jan Schwankmeyer, I, I believe that the way he reinvents forms all the time is also a way of juggling with censorship. And I find also that very exciting because then you can never sleep on what worked yesterday. You know, all, and it's, it keeps me alive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's also good for my own self. It's avoiding the demons of what is good and what's bad, but it's also a way, a very practical way to, to survive in a dictatorship, both. Yeah. Yes, and also to survive, to, to, to stay alive as an artist. Yes, creatively. And, and, yeah, creatively. Yeah. It's like, okay, I've done this. Maybe if they look at it long enough, they'll start reading stuff in there. So now you need to find another way. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep awake. Yeah. Right, yeah. They say you were saying? Just a replica again, because on the note of films, uh, in, in the 90s when there was freedom again, and um, no ideological censorship, everyone could do the films they want, very quickly the filmmakers realized that actually that means less freedom for several reasons. One is that there was no money. No one would, like, looking at the films of Tarkovsky, for example, who's filming in very long, at whatever he would long, if he needs... Uh, an army, there will be an army. The Soviet cinema was like this. Whatever the artists need, it will be provided. It will be paid for. It is there. Who is, there was no such producer <coughs> in our countries at least, maybe in Hollywood, but it's far away. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, you don't, simply don't have this freedom. You have to all the time uh, look at the, what small budget films rarely because uh, not too many films are produced. Uh, as you know, Lenin has said, film is the most important art form. So basically, they, they took it serious. They were producing a lot of films. In our countries, 90s especially, was a huge crisis. There were one film a year. Also, also because they had to reinvent the film language, right? They didn't have to, yeah. but they did. <laughs> Out of economic ah, reasons. Right. Yes. Yeah. And we asked you, Desi, also to bring an example of art mm. in a conflicted mm place. Mm. Um, what did you bring what, to, to show? Can we, can we have a look at it? <laughs> yeah. I brought it because it's about conflict and because it has a Dutch connection. Um, it's a piece of um, art that is 25 years old and it was made by a Bosnian uh, visual artist, Sheila Kameric. Uh, the year it was made was 95, and this is the year of the Srebrenica massacre. Um, Srebrenica was occupied by the Serb units for three years, and in the summer of um, 1995, uh, the city witnessed the bloodiest massacre in recent European history, where 8,000 people uh, died. Um, there were Dutch peacekeeping forces yeah. in Bosnia, which were um, there to not allow this to happen, uh, and they failed. Uh, they did what they could, 
or probably they did not, as the court in The Hague actually some years ago has decided that actually they were guilty of not providing this and directly guilty of uh, the deaths of 300 people. Uh, yeah, by, by Muslims kicking, kicking, kicking them off kicking, their who the came compound. to yeah. look yeah. for shelter to them and then kick them back and they found their death there. Uh, the, the words that you see, you can read them, are um, written by an unknown Dutch soldier from this uh, keep, keeping forces, and the girl is... Peacekeeping forces, yeah. Uh, yeah the, what did you say? Peacekeeping uh, forces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, the girl is the um, artist herself. I think this work uh, does several things at the same time. Um, at one point, on one level, it um, reveals the stereotypes that we produce about the other constantly. Um, it uh, very much is a label. You see how stigmatizing works, how easy it is to put a label and stigmatize someone. And it's striking that you see these eyes of, of the, the woman there. <coughs> uh, it shows that actually when you see the eyes of an individual person, you cannot generalize in such an ugly way. Actually, it just reveals and acts against the cliches that was there in the first place. I think it also on another level speaks about um, sort of this moral superiority, presumed moral superiority of the West towards the East. I think it's very much there in this text. So. Um, I find it's a very interesting uh, piece of art when we're talking about uh, the role of art in conflict uh, zones. And I think it's exactly the role, if put in essence, in a nutshell, is um, to invoke a sense of empathy with the other, with the person on the other side, with the enemy, mm -hmm. uh, to put you for a while in the head and the soul of the enemy after which they cannot be an enemy anymore because you already have an understanding of their point of view, you already have some empathy for their situation and this is what brings the conflict to a lower scale or is working towards ending it. And I think actually that this conflict nowadays in our societies, there is no war, uh, but it's deeply in our societies, I think, nowadays. There is conflict, there is a big ideological divide in the Western societies. Um, just to name Brexit, for example, the two sides um, think of each other as something, I don't know, less than a human. Like, there's so much hate and disrespect and uh, no possibility of a dialogue. Um, look at Trump, for example, what he did to the American society, how there is, uh, the country has split, the society has split in two. There was a very curious data which I recently came across that in the 60s, 4% of the Democrats in the US, 3% of the Republicans or vice versa, would be unhappy if their daughter or son marries someone from the other party. Six and four percent, so very small Six percent. and four, very yeah. small. Nowadays, they are 49 and 36 percent. 49 from the uh, Democrats. Yep. And uh, so, you can s <laughs> you see how the gap, this um, absolute disrespect, disregard, in a way, kind of uh, hatred, labeling the other side as unhuman almost. You cannot marry those guys, <laughs> even. Uh, it's um, everywhere. And I think the role of art and the, all, the role of centers like the Bali and the Red House is to create a space where you can hear the stories of the other, you can live them through, you can get emotional about the individual stories that very often challenge your perception of what is going on, how the world is. But then you understand better 
uh, after hearing these stories. This is where my passion for documentary uh, theatre also and art comes. Uh, you very often hear stories and see them in this work that are completely challenging uh, your perception of uh, even your own society. And then when you hear them, you, you understand better, you're more open for a dialogue, you're more understanding. The same with discussions of, at centres at here, uh, like, the, like the Bali, like here. I think there should be no um, prejudices against the people who can be on the stage. And nowadays we see in our society so often that people say, no, you should not give space. You should not be put certain people on stage because they have these absolutely unacceptable ideas. And they are going to tell things that are scandalous. This is throughout in our societies. Even you had it recently, I think, with a we did. Yeah, actually, we did. Yeah. with an Egyptian yeah. uh, writer and who uh, said she wouldn't take part in discussion here because because some time ago there was someone who said something that she doesn't like. I think this is showing a deep that our societies are in deep trouble. Uh, I think this attitude is um, distorting the, the texture of our societies and I think the role of art and the role of spaces like spaces for open debate is to sustain this effort to keep these spaces together, to keep, keep the possibility for uh, a dialogue, for trying to see the world through the, other, the eyes of the other. And this is a good example of that, by um, putting a very nasty text. A, a text which is supposedly also should describe this woman, who yeah. I personally find quite attractive. So basically it's a complete cost, uh, contrasting. And it, this is why it challenges the, the, the cliché, yeah. the prejudice, the, the stigmatization that this text represents. Mm. So in a nutshell, it's what an art center like yours or uh, like Kisangani can do um, uh, in, in one poster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's an effort that should be sustained in time and going back right. to revolution or evolution. I think it's more evolution. I don't believe in revolutions, but <coughs> you know, evolution, it's a sustained effort and people get tired if at some point there is no, somehow some structure to sustain their work. Uh, there should be more, I mean, there should be many more centers like yours emerging uh, in your country uh, in order for change to be able to happen. And with one bird, there won't be spring, as they say, <laughs> in my language at least. Um, and the other thing is that you said visas were difficult to obtain in your country. They were difficult to obtain in my country, but now there is no visa. We don't need visa to travel in most of the countries. So what happens when people get tired to try and change their country, create the spaces where they can work, they just move forward. They go to, to countries where these spaces exist. The structures are there. It's overwhelming for a long run to be this revolutionary working every day to create and sustain on your own muscles only this space that you have there. Um, and maybe this is why uh, we are the, mo the fastest shrinking country <laughs> demographically, uh, Bulgaria, because um, yes, the, the borders are open and people see that they can actually realize themselves and their ideas and have uh, more comfortable lives elsewhere, which is backfiring. And this is something that we don't talk much about, how this backfires in, into the country. Because then there is no one to create these spaces there. There is no one to sustain a meaningful dialogue. There is no one to produce quality art. There is no one to keep the level of journalism high. Um, so, yeah, we're all talking about the, how globalization brought advancement, progress to the world, but it, it brought something else as well. And actually, 
I think what we see nowadays in terms of populism and uh, the voters going very much for closing the borders, staying with, amongst ourselves, etc., it has to do with this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First, then you, you moved back to Kisangani, the place where you were born, from, because you started your artistic group um, in Kenya. And then you moved back. Um, was that also to... Do, is there some relationship with the fact that the, what Desi describes, that the place becomes empty and then the society can't sustain itself? Or is that, was it another necessity for to move back to? As I said earlier, it was at first I didn't think about like going there, the country uh, is getting empty. It was mm -hmm. really like hey, to do my work and to be in touch with what's really important for me. Mm -hmm. I need to be in the Congo. Yeah. But once you're there, then you realize, like, okay, yeah, when you talk to most young people here, there is only one dream. It is to cross the border. It will be better than being at home. Yeah. So then I'm like, I want to be here. I want to stay. And I want to be with people. What do we do? so that others start also seeing that it's important to be home. Or, but it doesn't mean that they cut themselves from outside, but it's, not, uh, it's like, how can we be outside <coughs> without putting a cross on any possibility of building anything here, locally? And so, then you start, you no, know, talking about the, the political, the philosophical, the necessity to build something locally. But I didn't begin with that. I, I, I arrived at that yeah. from just responding to a necessity. To I your own to necessity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Artistic necessity or personal necessity. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So would you wish that other people have are that awake to understand that they also need that place? Or what would you say to people who, 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 who see that the borders are open or that they at least can have their dreams, I think they can have their dreams realized, as Desi just also described from Bulgaria, somewhere else? Okay, now... Um there's a big difference in the Congolese context, which is that one, leaving the country is still extremely difficult. Yeah. You know, um, I talked about the work I'm doing with the elders from the National yeah. Valley. It was supposed to have its premiere in February, but we had to cancel because the elders could not get a, a visa. visa. No. And Uh, and so that's already a first step. You just don't leave when you want. It is a huge battle to just get to leave. And so maybe you can use that to say, look, rather than spending <coughs> five, ten years of your life dreaming of the day you will leave, is it possible to start something within those ten years since you're going to be here anyway? Which is meaningful, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so for me, it would begin there. But I always tell whoever has a possibility to, to, to leave, it's like, please go. Yeah. If you can go there and you know what you're going to do and you know that you can build something for yourself. But I'm not exaggerating if I, if I say that at least 75% of young Congolese leaving the country today and up in Europe, with no papers, they, cannot, they don't have places to stay, so they hop from one place to another. They work in construction sites and where they can be paid like three euros an hour, if they're lucky. This I know personally, you know, people who are in that situation. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's not paradise over there. It's rough and at least, and on top of that, it's going to be cold and you'll be <coughs> alone. 
the loneliness will kill you. So you start from there, but you cannot start from the, you know, the big discourse. That's just too much, too much. Because, and they can rightly say, oh, you can afford to say that because, hey, you're here, you have a house, you always have food, you get treated when you want, and if it's not enough here, you can always take a plane and go to Europe, and they'll be right to say that. So it's like, yeah, I'm a privileged in that context. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Piri, um, you brought uh, a, a piece of art you made yourself. Yeah, but I'm also really curious to see the, the previous uh, video, the Desi project. It was not video, it was just a... Just it was, you, it was one, um, oh, it was one poster, Sorry. one Did picture. Look, okay. We can have it up again if you want to, to look yeah. at it. Uh, can we, can we can look we at it again? It? The because I was just listening oh, okay. to you. I didn't, wasn't <laughs> aware. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> And just very briefly, um, yeah. and because we're gonna, we're gonna, um, uh, you brought um, your own one of your own work, work for it, um, uh, a short movie, which you, um, um, which we're gonna look now and then d discuss uh, afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. سر شورش دم دگر هفی ندلی من جمن را و بیجه هر تشت هن نباش به وقتی شورش چیه Beşerim, ji baniyan baniyan ra, ji hev dura dişend. Thank you. 
من نبو ایود دما کود مشیا من دخواست بمینه تو دکانی دست چه برده فرحت شما خوشکامن برستی جتا هست دکر سکره دخوازه وگره دلو چکم بختی من تم رشه من دخواست بمینم دلو دلی من هر دم بکولم دلو جارکین Can we ask you to join for the last part of the <laughs> conversation? Thank you for um, um, showing your film. Um, wonderful short film. Um, uh, those who leave turn into people who want to return. We've been talking a lot yeah. about those things. It's no consensus, of course, we try to. <laughs> mm. But um, um, is that true for yourself as well? Yes, yes, it's definitely true. I could have chosen to be a Dutch filmmaker and mm -hmm. let this be in the past, let this be of my parents' generation. But I think seeing their struggle because they tried to, to force another revolution after the revolution in Iran, this is what, what I always saw in my father's eyes growing up. Um, this, in some way, is the story of my own parents. And this is a repetitive story for the Kurds in general, in any part of Kurdistan. It's uh, inspired by the, <coughs> let's say, somewhat current situation that's... Lo it looks like it's almost ending, but for me, this, making this film, this was a way to, uh, to talk about what was going on there and the and the quote he says at the very end mm -hmm. um, is also about the criticism that we had here uh, on refugees coming from Syria and Iraq and other countries in 2015, 16, 17. 
uh, of course you don't just want to leave everything and burn your house down. But what if others already did that? So it's also by having him stay forcefully and you feel sorry for him staying, hopefully some audiences will understand that's actually why you have to leave. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And you do feel sorry, that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because everybody else leaves and there's not much left. Yeah. And um, this one was crowdfunded, huh? Yeah. That's the long list of names. Yes, I'm sorry for the extra minutes for the names. <laughs> um, yeah, and I consider myself really lucky being able to manage to uh, gather so many people, especially from Holland actually, who believed this story had to be told. Um, in the time I was crowdfunding this, I had just moved back to the Netherlands from, from Erbil, yeah. which at that time was 20 minutes from the front lines with ISIS. And I did not know, I actually didn't know where I, where I was living because I didn't know where the situation with ISIS would develop towards, would they move closer, would they eventually take over Erbil, which is uh, 1.5 million people city and also kind of the safe zone for um, 2 million refugees and for 34 consulates who believe in rebuilding the re region and creating like a mini Dubai. So there's so many things going on at the edge of where we told we were trying to tell this story. I held a debate night right here in this very room to talk about what was going on. I started writing for the Volkskrant back then because I had witnessed so much and I didn't know, I think I exploded and I didn't know where to, what to do with all the pieces of my mind that were scattered everywhere. And um, when, I, so ISIS appeared in spring 2014, and I was supposed to shoot my first future film six months later. And of course, the main sponsor pulled back, which was a local Iraqi Kurdish sponsor with lots of money because things were going well. And at the same time, I came back empty handed to the Netherlands. I left a fairly good career in the film world here. So I had nothing and I had so much to tell. Therefore, crowdfunding and also the eagerness of the audience here to <coughs> hear and see those stories from that world made it possible to tell this, which I'm happy with uh, because there's so much more power in this film because of the way it is funded than had I just gotten 20 or 30,000 from a film fund. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Faustan just said uh, repeatedly that it's out of his own artistic necessity to go back. Um, is that the same for you, if you look at this? I found it very interesting when you said that because uh, I think it's it could be true, but it's so complicated because if it's for my own artistic necessity and the story doesn't matter I can work here or I can work there but with within an easier field mm -hmm. because this field you can't just pick up or I can't just pick up a camera and do everything by myself it requires so many people around you to just make a seven minute film as you just saw from the end credits so it, it is it is and it's not it's an excuse to um, show that world to this world and mm -hmm. to create a mirror for that world and also to bring those two together on set because I brought a couple of crew members from here but I also made sure to use a couple of people from there although I must say all the good ones left <laughs> at that point. So I figured at least if at least the assistants are uh, from the Kurdistan region, 
then at least they can learn from really good professionals and then their next steps will be easier. So I think if it would be for me, yeah. just me, I have enough personal stories and emotions to work here. But this place just keeps on pulling me back and because there's a lack of stories coming from it. And in this film I chose to still point into the direction of war, but we still haven't seen, I haven't seen a single film in which you can see what it is people have been fighting for. Like what is a normal, what is normal daily life in Erbil, for example, looked like? I don't think any of you has any idea. So I have to go back and show you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you, uh, I understood that you are also con contemplating, and that's again relating to uh, a lot of the things we just heard, that you've been contemplating trying to open up uh, an art house cinema. Yes, yeah. I have to. I have to. Uh, there's oh, oh. a lot of abandoned uh, cinemas yeah. in, the, in Iraqi Kurdistan and beautiful buildings that have just been locked and left. And there's one specifically, it's called Cinema Cristal, the name alone already. It's at the foot of the 8,000 year old citadel that you see in the background of this short film as well. That's Erbil, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it's there, and I've been looking at it, driving by it, sneaking in, I've even brought architects to look inside and see how much renovation work it needs. And I was there a month ago, and it's still there, still locked. I sneaked in again. It has, when you enter, it has this crystal ceiling. I think it has my name written on it. If I don't do it, then who starts this uh, cultural space? And I feel like the time is ready. We just screened, uh, shouted from the rooftops there, finally, two years after, after its mm -hmm. uh, premiere, also a month ago in Erbil. And um, I think with an audience of 100 people, it was the <coughs> first time we had a proper uh, audience about cinema, about representation, about reclaiming your own identity, like all these topics we are discussing here. So I feel like there's a community now that has an understanding of what is needed and there's also this thirst more than five to ten years ago to create and to share stories and to go back and help and um, maybe it's because of the war against ISIS that people have seen how um, one-dimensional the stories are that are coming out about where they live. So in all these senses, and also because economically it is stable enough, and um, also because I also have the support from, for example, the Dutch consulate in Erbil. So also this Western validation is really important. Mm -hmm. I think the time is right to copy you guys, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm. That's a very unhealthy thing. I know, but what yeah. can we say? Uh, yeah, you, anyway, yeah, you, you, I'm screwed. It's you, too you late. You hooked already. Yeah. You know? and, and also, actually, what you just said in the beginning uh, supported me because I've been in conflict with myself because there's two things I want to do now as an artist. I have to make my future film, or I create this platform for everyone else to tell their stories. And I want to do them both at the same time. So I want to go back to make a proper one and a half hour film. But I also want everyone else to have a space where they can show their films, where we can have discussions, where we can talk about what is going on in the country, in the region, in the world. We, yeah. I'm afraid I'm you can advise you, you, you can advise against it, but it's your fault. Yeah. But I think the beautiful yeah. things you just said. Yeah. And I wanna come. And <laughs> of course. Just be there. Because one thing about 
working from places like this, yeah. uh, like the Congo, or even what you describe of Airbnb, um, or Bulgaria, uh, is that there's a lot of loneliness. You mm -hmm. And so you're always in the lookout for... Like-minded people. Yeah, and yeah. people who are doing things in different contexts, but things that you can really relate to. And yeah. And how did you see if you're excited already, can you imagine how excited people there are and how much yeah. they need it? Yeah. So yeah. It is. It is. But beware. <laughs> yeah. It's too late already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um um before I close off, I'm going to look into the audience, whether there's people who are going to join in into the conversation or have something to say or ask. Or, uh, yeah, Andrea, I come along because there's people oh, yeah. who want to listen in to as well. So that's why it's important to use the microphone. Thank you all so much for sharing all these ideas. It's, I really enjoyed listening to all of you. I have a question for Faustin. You said, I started doing this job because I don't want to be alone anymore. And then in the film you said, I do this because I surround myself with good people. What makes a good person for you? What do they have in common? What do you appreciate in them? Ooh. What is a good person, at least for you? At least, uh, since you referred to the clip we saw, to the yeah. clip we saw, um, I think I added that it's like the people I can dream with, <coughs> and we can look in a certain direction together and say, "Hey, let's do it. It is possible," you know, and knowing that again, it's never given once and for all. You know, we might all feel excited and motivated. It's possible today, and then, yeah, a month later, everyone is like, no, it's not possible. And like in the film, Papier Botani, whom you see there, and uh, after 17 years, he decided that he couldn't bear it anymore, so he stayed in Europe. He decided in last October, it's like, it's too much. If I go back there, that country will kill me. So for my own sanity, I need to stay. I don't want to be there. So he's still a good person, and, but for now, it's important that he stays away from that. If I was to analyze the situation, I would say it's not the right choice, but I respect it, and I still think that he is one of those. You know, and yeah. And you see, it's about identifying allies. And this is what makes it possible not to be alone. And once you've identified people you can walk with, you hang on to one another until it's not possible. And like, like in the example of Papi, it's like, hey, now. I need to go here. But who knows, maybe in 10 years, something else can be together, can bring us together again. You know? yeah. Can I say just yes. something? Yeah. Yes. Uh, because we were, it's very interesting to me that we had, it seems to me, three cases of coming back <coughs> to do uh, a project that you really need. Uh, you find it's relevant for your context back home. You find it important for yourself uh, to do. Because I also went back uh, from Budapest uh, then to create. To the, Sofia. The yeah. So I started asking myself, so what is this? Where does this come from, actually, this, this need? And I think that it's at the end, um, you know, they say that home is where you understand everything and you are being understood. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and you know, exile is a difficult thing, I think. Um, you so often feel not understood, 
not fitting, um, not speaking the same language, not literally. <laughs> um, and home is like uh, Slovenka Drakulic was saying, it's like sleeping, going into your home slippers, you know. When you are in another country, you're on high heels, home, you're in your slippers, you're comfortable, you feel accepted, understood. Um, and I think that more and more people who have this experience of living somewhere else have this urge to, to go back. And it's about adding meaning to their life because doing something for yourself, creating space for other people also adds meaning to your life. So I don't know whether you, you can relate to that, but I think this is what uh, probably is in common of all three, that we were also looking for meaning. Yep, probably, well, yeah. Anybody else who has a thing to say, then I think um, I'm gonna call it a night. And um, thank you all very, very much for this intense conversation. It's, it's amazing to, to be able to um, listen to you, all three of you, how you use your imagination in your work and how you create spaces which are places and pieces of art in themselves. It's really, really wonderful listening to you. Very, very inspiring. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we can have a drink at the bar. And um, uh, again, thank you. Thank you very, very much for thank you. thinking out loud and doing this. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.